Okay, I think we, it is time to start. With the, this is the first uh, the session number one, which will uh, deal with the genetics and biology of uh, Xylella fastidiosa. This session will be followed by a second session on the same topic uh, tomorrow morning, as well as you can find several contributions displayed as a poster in the, during the poster uh, uh, session. Uh, I'm very honored to introduce uh, uh, the speakers of this uh, session, who are uh, um, some of the researchers that uh, directly or indirectly contributed to set up and to advance the uh, ongoing research uh, in Europe. Uh, we will start with the presentation uh, uh, of Dr. Blanca Landa from the Institute uh, of Agricultura uh, Agricol uh, um, uh, Sostenibile uh, del Consiglio Superiore de Investigación uh, Scientifica di Cordoba. She will present a collab collaborative uh, work done on uh, the characterization uh, of Xylella fastidiosa subspecies multiplex with a particular focus uh, on, uh, on the strains uh, isolated uh, in, uh, in Spain. Uh, the title of her presentation is Understanding the Potential Origin and the Epidem Epidemiological Consequences of the Spanish Outbreak Caused by Xylella fastidiosa uh, subspecies multiplex. Blanca, you have 15 minutes. Thank you, thank you, Maria. So as Maria just mentioned, uh, this is the result of a collaborative work of all the people listed here, but especially I want to thank Andrina Castillo and Annalisa Gianpetrucci for the effort they, they put in, in, in the work. Um, not only CSIC, but all the institutions uh, that uh, I showed the logos uh, here uh, did, uh, were involved in the, in the project. So as we listen this, this morning, uh, um, you already know, Silela Fastidiosa emerged as a serious threat to the European uh, Mediterranean landscape and agriculture uh, in 2013 when it was associated to uh, the devastating epidemic in olive trees in Italy. Um, after that, the Office on a Mandatory Monitoring within the European Union revealed that Silela was uh, uh, present not only in Italy but in different areas within Europe. Uh, Silella fastidiosa in Europe is not uh, a single thing. Uh, um, we had found four different subspecies belonging to nine sequence type or genotype. Um, among them, the most uh, frequent uh, detections uh, are from subspecies multiplex. This is the, because we had focus on, on these sub subspecies. And if we focus on to the total host plant identified infected in the European Union, more than 75% uh, of the host plant uh, infected are uh, due to uh, subspecies multiplex. The current situation in Spain in the Balearic Islands uh, is that uh, we are under con containment since uh, December 2017. Um, we have detected three subspecies, uh, so subspecies Pauca ST80 in Ibiza, subspecies multiples ST81 in Menorca, and subspecies fastidiosa ST1, and subspecies multiples ST7 and ST81 in, in Mallorca. On the other hand, in Alicante, we are still under eradication since in the first notification in 2017, and currently in the demarcated area that uh, covers more than 130,000 hectares, only one single subspecies, um, a sequence type 6 uh, belonging to subspecies multiples has been detected. Concerning the host plants uh, in the Balearic Islands, there are 25, uh, sorry, 21 species, uh, including very important crops such as olive, uh, oleaster, uh, um, grapes, and, and almonds, but also we have detected in ornamental plants in Fraxinus, Acacia, and in several uh, plants that belongs to the Mediterranean landscape. In Alicante, we have detected uh, 12 species infected by, uh, mainly by, uh, only by subspecies multiples ST6. And I have to say that more than 90% of the positive samples are uh, from almond. 
if we compare the different host plants that are infected by the different subspecies in Spain, uh, ST6 in Alicante and ST81 in, in Mallorca, only five are in common. One interesting point is that in Mallorca and Menorca, we can find easily uh, olive and wild olive infected by ST81, uh, showing decay symptoms and other symptoms that resemble to the, those caused by sub subspecies pauca. But uh, in Alicante, so far, no uh, olive tree has been detected infected by ST6. Even though uh, both plants coexist in the terrace in the area, um, as you can see here, uh, almond tree is severely infected, but uh, the trees, the olive trees are completely healthy. The taxonomy placement of Silella fastidiosa and strains in, in Europe is of applied relevance. It's quite important because the European Commission mandatory management strategies are based on the subspecies present in each region or in each outbreak. It's not only important for the host plant that has to be monitored, but also for the eradication. Currently, the assignation of Silella fastidiosa strains into subspecies and sequence type in Europe is mainly based on multilocus sequen sequence type analysis. And here we show the uh, phylogenetic uh, network, sorry, uh, of all the ST described up to date uh, based on the alignment of the seven genes, the, the seven multilocus genes. So if we pay attention to the subspecies multiplex, you can see that the four uh, sequence types described in Europe are really closely related using this approach. Consequently, we, we thought that uh, uh, the use of whole genomic sequencing can provide higher phylogenetic resolution to determine dispersal paths and also the relationships among the strength of biological and quality relevance in Europe. And this can also help us to infer the biological and the ecological feature of those strains. For that, we use a, a genome sequencing approach. Uh, uh, we uh, sequence, uh, use uh, 18 partial genomes from subspecies multiples, 10 new isolates, belonging to the four sequence type that has been described in Europe. Fitting strains were from Spain, including three strains from Fastidiosa, three from Italy and three from France. They were also isolated from different crops, ornamentals and also spontaneous vegetation. And we compare those uh, isolates to the 37 uh, genomes that were available in, in the database. And that they, they were uh, uh, isolating in Europe, US, uh, USA, and Brazil. So this tree, phylogenetic tree, uh, show the, uh, is rooted with the Silella fastidiosa subspecies fastidiosa isolate, and we showed with the geography-based ancestral uh, state reconstruction analysis that uh, uh, this subspecies multiplex originated mainly from uh, southeastern USA, as you see here from the probability likelihood values. Also, uh, we saw that the isolates from California and Europe uh, and also Brazil are consequence of introductions. Uh, we show that uh, the, there is uh, five introduction events in, in Europe, one associated in Italy uh, to ST87, uh, two in, Cors in Corsica associated to ST6 and 7, and two in Spain, one in the Balearic Islands, associated to ST81, and another one in Alicante, associated to ST6. One important uh, fact was that the, there was a lack of monophyly for isolate assigned to ST6, as you see here. The isolate uh, from Alicante that were described as ST6, close related to ST7, and they are uh, paraphyletic from uh, isolate from ST6, from California, that was the first one described, and the ST6 from Corsica. So they are paraphyletic, as you see here. And this ST6 was closely related to ST81 from, from Mallorca. Also, I have to say that all the isolates uh, from Europe are integrated in a cluster that um, is a relative young cluster uh, with a very limited uh, inter specific recombination as uh, was described by the work, previous work by Nani uh, and collaborators. If we remove all the possibility of uh, regions that are recombinant, we obtain exactly the same uh, clustering as you see here. And I want to also to mention that in Alicante, all the uh, ST6 isolate 
uh, show different uh, genotypic uh, uh, profile. We found some isolate that has no plasmids, some isolate that harbor two plasmids, and some isolate that harbor only one plasmid. So if you want to know more about this plasmid distribution in Alicante uh, demarcated area, please visit the poster P22. And also you will have the chance to listen to Miguel Roman in session eight, uh, uh, talking about the phenotypic diversity among those strains differing in plasmid content. We also perform a phylogenetic tree based on the single uh, nucleotide polymorphism, uh, more than 5,000 cure SNPs. Um, as you see here, we found exactly the same uh, pattern, the, all the European strains cluster here uh, on the top. Um, what we can see is that the number of SNPs and the nucleotide diversity of European populations uh, are indicative of recent introductions because uh, we found only uh, within Alicante uh, strains uh, 10 SNPs, whereas in Balearic Islands we found only three SNPs, and in Tuscany only one SNP. Also, if, if we look to the uh, nucleotide diversity, we found that the uh, California, within the California and within the Europe uh, population, the nucleotide diversity was low as we compared to the southeastern USA, USA populations that, as you know, are the ones that uh, showed high uh, inter-sub-specific recombination. Also, uh, if we look to the nucleotide diversity in, in Alicante, it was very low and also in Balearic, Balearic Islands that are indicative of a very young uh, clade or introductions. Looking into the frequency of recombination events and their location along the genome, uh, here uh, we compare uh, the recombination event between subspecies fastidiosa isolates from Mallorca and the subspecies multiples from, from Europe. So we found that the, uh, these isolates share the highest number of recombination events with isolates from Tuscany and then with isolates from Mallorca and then with isolates from, from France. So there was more evidence of a recombination uh, between allopatric than sympathetic population. As you remember, subspecies fastidiosa and subspecies multiplex here are present both of them in the same island in, in Mallorca. Uh, we also noticed that there was no recombination events with the isolates from Alicante. And we also identified that the recombination events were recent. And most recombination genes uh, were hypothetical proteins of unknown, unknown function. So now that we, we have described that we have a different subspecies multiplexed in Spain, we want to see what is the meaning or the biological uh, differences among those strains. For those, uh, we are performing uh, uh, experiments in, in olive because, as you told, I told you before, uh, in Alicante, the, the trees, uh, olive trees, get not in, infected by, by the strains in a biosecurity uh, growth chamber. So we are using the three genotypes that are more uh, commonly grown in, in Spain, Ficual, Ojiblanca, and Arbequina. And we are using two strains belonging to ST6 that di differ in their plasmid content. Uh, one strain from uh, Mallorca uh, belonging to ST81. We are using one strain from Pauca from Ibiza, and we are comparing with the, the donor strain from, from Italy. We are monitoring uh, symptoms development over time and quantifying the bacterial movement by QPCR at the inoculation point at, at 10 centimeters from the inoculation point. And also we are doing some plant phenotyping measuring different physiological parameters, as you see here. So the work is in progress, but I have to say that after uh, more than seven months, there is no symptoms at, at all, so plants look like uh, healthy. And you can see that we found some differences according to the olive cultivar. In, in green, you have the, uh, sorry, the QPCR uh, positive plants at uh, six months uh, obtained at 10 centimeters from the inoculation point. In Arbequina, all the strains were able in, with a more or less low frequency to uh, move uh, upwards. But in Ojiblanca, uh, strain uh, ST81 was not able and on Piquar, none of the ST6 isolate were able to, to move on the plant. We are also doing a lot of uh, uh, spectral signature measurements 
from 450 till 1,700 uh, nanometers, and we are seeing some trends, but still we are in the process of analyzing all data. Also, the pigment contents, chlorophyll, flavonol, and nitrogen index, uh, we had found some differences according to the olive uh, variety and also with the inoculation of some of the strains. But I told you this uh, work is still in process and hopefully we will uh, have some results soon. So just to conclude, I would like to say that the, uh, the sequence type described by MLST analysis are not monophyletic. I showed you that we have two uh, groups, independ independent group, groups uh, labeled as ST6, in, one in Alicante and one in, in France. Uh, Silella fastidiosa subspecies multiplex has been introduced multiple times into Europe. Um, it appears that most of the introduction originated from California. There is evidence of recombination between Silella fastidiosa sympathetic population, but we don't know yet if uh, there is no conclusive evidence if this happens in Europe or it happens before uh, the introduction uh, occurring in Europe. There is a need to use whole genome sequences to study pathogen introduction, especially at outbreaks stage, to provide sufficient phylogenetic resolution. This can help to determine the path of uh, dispersal or the relationships among the strains that are of biological and quarantine relevance. And I think that uh, overall, our work illustrates the risks associated with the commercial threat of plant material at global scale, and also emphasize the need to develop effective policy to limit the, the likelihood of pathogen pollution into knife regions. I want to acknowledge, as I told you, all the collaborators, especially uh, the team at Cordoba, at CSIC, and uh, the coordinators of different research groups, Esther Marco, Maria Saponari, Rodrigo Almeida, and Leonardo de la Fuente. And thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, Blanca. Thank you, Blanca, for uh, your presentation and to all colleagues that shared the isolate to, per, to perform this uh, analysis as well as the protocol to culture because that is also a critical point. Any question to Blanca? Thank you. Uh, so I see that the, your pathogenic studies, some of them, they are at seven months stage. How, think, how long they should last for you to have a, a, a final answer? What do you think? Uh, we don't know yet because uh, uh, as a difference to the experiments conducted in Bari that were performed under greenhouses condi conditions, we are using a growth chamber with more uniform uh, temperature. But the problem is that the plant uh, grows so healthy that uh, we have to... Uh, transplant and um, maybe in a few weeks we will, <laughs> they will reach the, the lamp. So I don't know. We, we will try to, to uh, leave the experiment as long as we can, but uh, we don't know if it, it will be able to, 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 to finish before symptom expression. Yeah. Other question? If you can present yourself. Thank you for your presentation, Blanca. I'm Lorenzo Leon from IFAPA in Spain. So, uh, in your opinion, I know it's too early, but uh, uh, do you expect a different uh, resistance response of the different cultivars and the different subspecies of uh, Silela? Yeah, uh, that's for sure, because we already know from the Dono strain, that the, the one from Italy that is very, very highly virulent, that you have a very different response on, on the olive cultivars. Even some of them don't show symptoms, but they become infected. Other don't show symptoms and um, uh, almost uh, um, limit the bacterial infection. Um, I'm sure that the, with the high the genetic background of, of the olive, we will have uh, huge differences. No, yeah. but, but I mean the, the same cultivar toward different uh, subspecies. I mean the cultivar resistant in Italy will be resistant also in other conditions? Or what do you expect? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if the mechanism of resistance or are the same, we, we should expect at least a, a, a general trend. Yeah, but uh, we don't know. Yeah. There is time for one more question. Uh, 
and Nicola Spence from DEFRA in UK. You've suggested five potential separate introductions into Europe. What are your thoughts about potential pathways and hosts uh, that could have um, caused that to happen? C can you repeat, please? You proposed five separate introductions. Have you got any evidence about which plants, which hosts might have been the pathway? Uh, maybe you, you will listen, uh, I think, tomorrow, but Eduardo Moralejo, uh, one of our hypotheses was the plant movement. Uh, in the specific case of uh, Mallorca, it may be almond, almond trees, because the legislation in, on grapes was very hard in the past, but not for almonds. So I think it was a little bit more relaxed. Uh, there was a lot of introduction of new um, almond varieties from California into Europe. Uh, I think that was maybe the, 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 the point. Also, we are doing what you know, a comparison of the, uh, back, uh, of the strain detected in, in Mallorca, and some of them are almost identical to some detected in, in California on almonds. Yeah, specific, specifically fastidiosa subspecies. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Blanca. So now the, uh, the next speaker is Pasquale, Dr. Pasquale Saldarelli from the Institute for Sustainable Plant Protection, uh, uh, CNR in Bari. Uh, Pasquale will present the latest uh, achievement uh, from the investigation on the resistance, uh, the mechanism for resistance in olive and the similarities uh, that we are finding uh, with uh, what has been described in citrus and grapes. Thank you, Pasquale. They are changing. Uh, <coughs> it was Come on over there. Okay, I will. Uh, will start. Just pointing the the finger to. The to the screen. I will give some insights in the, into our... I will give some insights into, into our st uh, studies uh, concerning the differential response of all olive cultivars to xylella fastidiosa infections and also some giving some parallels, analogies to what is known to on uh, citrus uh, uh, and grape uh, as, as a model. Uh, xylella resistance in olives, uh, this is uh, a, a slide from colleagues from Brazil, Alessandra de Sosa, is known in uh, mandarin and citrus reticulata. And uh, uh, from, the, from the features, from the point of view, genetically point of view, uh, some uh, among the, the upregulated genes that were described in this paper in the, from these authors were uh, uh, leucine rich repeat uh, uh, resistance uh, like uh, kinase. Uh, you have here the, the uh, indication, the numbers uh, indicator, indicating the analogies of homologous gene in Arabidopsis thaliana. While <coughs> from the anatomical point of view, morphological point of view, uh, these authors uh, d d did not find uh, any involvement of a different morphology of the xylem uh, tissues uh, in, the, in, the, in the induction of uh, in the explanation of resistance, while they found some involvement or lignin de deposition uh, in, uh, in, um, in, resistant, in resistant cultivars. This is resistance in vitis, as Walker, uh, Andrew Walker reported in the, last, um, in the last congress in Mallorca, which is uh, uh, present in uh, wild vitis. Uh, in this case, you have vitis arizonica 
Candicans B4317, and uh, in that case, they uh, identified uh, a, a gene, uh, a locus, uh, uh, which is called PDR1, PD, uh, Peer's Disease Resistance uh, Resistant 1, among the other. They described also other, other genes. And particularly in a recent paper in, in which these um, Californian uh, colleagues uh, give an assessment of the uh, disease susceptibility of uh, different vitis cultivars uh, with, um, to, to xylella fastidiosa, they found that one of the, um, the among the, the important features that are linked to resistance uh, they can find pathogen abundance. So you can see here R stand for uh, resistant uh, uh, and S for susceptible on the uh, um, low uh, left. Uh, you see the, the abundance of the population size of the xylella fastidiosa in the resistant and susceptibles. Resistance uh, is, seems to be linked from the genetical point of view to, again, leucine-rich repeat receptor like kinase, and also to the anatomy. In that case, the anatomy uh, play a major role also. Uh, uh, in, in fact, they describe, uh, they associate the resistance to the presence of smaller vessel diameters. The area is important uh, in terms of uh, try to isolate the bacteria in the vessel. So uh, larger, larger vessels are, to, are more difficult to, be, uh, to isolate the bacteria. And then uh, the, this, uh, this, is, uh, this was a previous paper from uh, uh, Professor Lindo, which associated again in the stem a lower population size of the <coughs> bacteria to the, to the resistance and also the, the number of vessels colonized in the, in the, in the resistant uh, cultivars. Here uh, you have our situation in, uh, in, in olive. As you know, uh, we identified a couple of cultivars up to now, uh, Lecino and uh, FS17, and you have here some uh, um, disease severity, as you can see in, in these cultivars. Uh, in, you can see there is a limited and localized desiccation that uh, allow the Lecino to resist to the infections. And uh, now we are starting to uh, evaluate other features of this, uh, uh, this uh, resistance in, in Lecino. Uh, from the, for example, from the anatomical point of view, from the morphological point of view, we found uh, uh, in a stem uh, a, a smaller percentage of occluded vessels in Lecino and FS17. Uh, uh, and also we found uh, a, a, a smaller vessel area, also a, a smaller vessel diameters in Lecino, not uh, with respect to the two susceptible varieties, which are in this case Cellina and Oliarola, as you can see from uh, this, this, uh, this graph. FS17 is an intermediate uh, situation with this. Uh, and other features of uh, xylella resistance in olive is the pathogen abundance. We stress on, this, uh, on, this, uh, on the number of, uh, uh, of the population sites of the, of, uh, of the bacterium in the cells uh, because we found uh, uh, repeatedly uh, lower population sites in uh, FS17 and in Lecino as compared to the susceptible, the two resistant as compared to the susceptible cultivars. And we are performing now a, a time course, I would say, study uh, in different seasons, uh, different seasons uh, to evaluate the, the abundance of uh, xylella in uh, different tissues uh, along uh, a, a single twigs. Uh, we dis we uh, distinguished uh, big uh, twigs, uh, half a centimeter more thick, uh, from small twigs and uh, from... Uh, um, leaves and patients. And the, in every case we found uh, in the resistant cultivars, in that case is FS17, we found uh, uh, a smaller population, a, a, limit, a, a smaller population size. The same was also observed uh, in Lecino. As you can see, the same situation was present in Lecino. And that was uh, a surprise, uh, a nice surprise that we have in the field uh, because we found uh, three 
uh, um, trees that were of Ogliarola salentina, which is uh, the trunk, which is the, 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 I would say, the, the, the rootstock on which uh, Lecino was grafted in the, in the past, before the Xylella infections. And uh, is, uh, is, uh, these, these three uh, uh, trees are in the outbreak area. And as you, ca uh, uh, as you can see, you have the vegeta vegetative status of these plants, uh, uh, the, the one from Lecino and Oliarola. And also in, the, in, in that case, uh, we uh, evaluated the pathogen abundance, the population size of, this, uh, uh, of the bacterium in, in the different parts of the trees, in the Lecino parts and uh, in the, in the, in the Oliarola part. And as, and as you can see, uh, again in Lecino, on the same tree, you have uh, a lower uh, population size. Uh, in one case, uh, it, it was un undetectable, so the, the CQ from the QPCR was uh, uh, very, very, very high. Uh, and this is the last part of my presentation, uh, reporting what we uh, are imagining. I, I this is an hypothesis on the feature, among the features of xylella resistance in olive. We already published the uh, entranscriptome profiling of, uh, of olive cultivars in trees, and we found that uh, the susceptible cultivars, uh, Oliarola, uh, suffer a sort of draw stress. These are the, the genes that uh, we found uh, um, upregulated in Oliarola. While in Lecino, among the other genes, we, uh, are, uh, we found, uh, again, uh, some uh, uh, resistance uh, like kinase, uh, leucine-rich uh, uh, proteins. Uh, uh, one of them was described in this paper was the 35710. That were are upregulated. Uh, mm, we performed uh, other additional transcriptome studies uh, using uh, uh, different uh, strain of xylella. You can see here, uh, CO33, it was a strain that was isolated in Italy, and the Dono is our strain, Apulian strain, using different um, combination of cultivars, Lecino, the resistant, Cellina, the susceptible, FS17, and Frantoio, which, a, uh, a, which is a cultivar that has an intermediate uh, situation, response, in terms of this is severity to to, um, to the plants. And, and what we are observing are chronic infections, or late infections. We uh, uh, expect that the symptoms appear uh, after one year at least in, uh, in, the, in the susceptible cultivars. And these trials were, were made in, uh, in the field uh, as well as uh, before in the, in, the, in the greenhouse. In that case, you have uh, uh, the, the trial, the transcriptome studies that were made in, um, in, the, in, the, in the field. The summary, but is a part of the work of these transcriptome studies that are ongoing, is that some common traits uh, among the, all these combinations exist, which are related, we are uh, stressing this, uh, uh, this e our interest in, uh, on uh, this leucine receipt, receipt uh, repeat receptor like kinase, uh, and, and you can see here the, 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 the homologous uh, in, uh, in uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, which are uh, very related to uh, a group uh, in the big family of these uh, uh, um, proteins. They, are, uh, they belong to the, to the group 12, which are uh, associated to, um, to the plant immune response, similarly to, to well-known receptors, which are flagelling sensing 2 and uh, the FTU receptors. And uh, if you move back to the grape, this is the organization of the, the locus PDR1 uh, in, uh, in grape. Uh, the, and you, you can see here the gene annotated among the, this gene. You have the gene, one of the homologous that we found uh, in olive, uh, which is the 35710. Uh, um, which was found, uh, uh, which were found upregulated up in, uh, in, uh, in olive. And similarly, in, uh, in, uh, in the paper from uh, Alessandra de Sosa, uh, they again reported a couple of uh, genes that we found upregulated. Uh, um, upregulated um, among the other, this 80-80-50, uh, this was interesting because uh, recently, 
there was a paper in which uh, this gene was uh, associated to, to a mechanism of cell wall integrity sensing. So that, um, that means that uh, it seems that these are receptors that uh, sense uh, the, the integrity of the cell wall. Uh, and uh, as, we can, uh, as we know, uh, xylella uh, uh, is aggressive, uh, possess a sort of uh, cell wall degrading enzymes that, uh, that, uh, um, that, uh, that degrade the, the cell wall. So perhaps uh, our working hypothesis is that these uh, genes are uh, related to this sort of mechanism. Uh, they also show it that MIC2, that was the acronym that they used for this uh, gene, was uh, required for resistance to a fungal uh, root pathogen that uh, reproduce, that multiply in the, in the, in the, in the xylem. Uh, we are uh, also performing some uh, studies of, uh, we are following the, the, the expression of this gene in different cultivars, some of them uh, respond uh, in, uh, to, the, to the present, not all, so we are, it's, a, it's a, 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 a study that is ongoing, but we were, uh, okay, that is strange, because Lichino should be I, eh? no, sorry, sorry. It was not this. So we found that uh, some colleagues uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Lecce University, they found uh, the, the, the same situation that we found of uh, an increase uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, resistance-like kinase. My final uh, uh, slides, uh, why do we say resistance? It's a sort of provocation uh, that uh, I know that many of, uh, of you do not agree with this, uh, I, I see the smile. <laughs> and uh, we, co we speak of resistance because of the, uh, of the pathogen abundance. So our definition of resistance, which is not semantic, is a technical, is a technical uh, definition, uh, which you can find in several um, publications that you find in the, uh, in the bottom, uh, in the bottom of, um, of my slides because we found that uh, these, uh, these uh, um, cultivars are able to limit the pathogen replication. So our conclusion is that there are analogies uh, uh, in grape more than in situs, perhaps for the morphology. So, and our ongoing work is to acquiring information on the uh, olive gene locus involved, because a notation of uh, the availability of uh, a good olive genome uh, is not, uh, they, they are not available. So we face with this uh, big, big problem uh, and we are also um, proceeding to try to test our hypothesis uh, of uh, the involvement of this category of proteins in the resistance. And these are my acknowledgement to all the colleagues that participated and allowed me to present this, uh, this data and to the organizer. Pasquale. Any question uh, for Pasquale? Uh, one question. Thank you, Pasquale. Uh, so do you consider the, the area of the silent vessel could be used as a screening tool, or, or is it still too early to say that? That is interesting because we are looking for a set of uh, features, I would say, uh, to, to classify cultivars. What the um, colleagues from, uh, from California they, uh, described in grape is that uh, once they found a cultivar with large vessel, they are more susceptible because the plant is not able to uh, isolate the pathogen uh, by the production of xylos. Uh, of Tylos, sorry. And uh, this was uh, uh, true uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Xylella, but also in, I don't remember, it's a fungus. Also, it was described in that paper that correlates with the vessel uh, area, vessel diameter. We are testing this possibility. Other question? For the moment, not so. Grazie, Pasquale.
So the, nec the next presentation will be given by Professor uh, Leonardo de la Fuente from University of Auburn, uh, who will present the work on the recombination of this naturally competent pathogen and uh, to which extent this can contribute to the uh, appearance of new uh, variants or to uh, the adaptive uh, uh, feature of this bacterium to colonize a new environment. The title of the presentation is uh, Extend and Ecological Significance of Homologous Recombination in Xylella Fastidiosa. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Hopefully, I can figure this out. And uh, the work that I'm going to talk about today is a work that we did in my lab, but uh, I had to acknowledge that the people who really done the analysis was a collaboration with Neha Pornis, which is a Pro, a new professor in our department who is um, uh, especially on Santa Mona's uh, genome analysis, and two of my students, uh, Prem and Marcus. Uh, so if you go to the next one, this one? Okay. So I'm going to talk about generation of genetic variation. We, you guys heard all the talks by Blanca and Marina Schack that we saw, we're looking at how uh, these bacteria are different from each other. So how do the different bacteria can generate this diversity is uh, multiple uh, mechanisms, but basically you can do point mutations that caused by DNA copying errors, or horizontal gene transfer, that is the topic that I'm gonna talk about today. That really is uh, basically the idea of you have DNA from other sources, uh, exogenous sources, and then you recombine your genome or, uh, for a model recombination. And this is equivalent of uh, sex in eukaryotes, yeah? So this, uh, the idea like why eukaryotes go into sex is to generate genetic diversity uh, is, is, is an co analog concept. So um, the idea of why homological recombination is important is, uh, is debatable, but uh, is in general, uh, the tendency is that it increases the genetic variation and potentially improves the response to natural selection. That's the idea, this is taken from a very good uh, review paper at Boston in 2009, and uh, this figure is from this paper, and he represents here uh, one of the examples of why uh, eukaryotes undergo sex. Uh, and one is, uh, of course, the most interest is not the, uh, the, the uh, uh, diversity. So this is one of the models to explain this as future Mueller model. So what you see here is uh, a fitness landscape, and this is like a hurdle, yeah? some kind of mountain or some kind of problem that you have to overcome when you encounter something new as a bacteria, in this case. And you see here represented here before recombination. After recombination, you will see that some of these uh, red dots represent populations that they were able to climb that mountain of the Finland landscape and get to the top. So they were successful in that. And after selection, you will expect that uh, you will see only these successful populations that climb that mountain, you will find them in nature. And this is what uh, I'm going to talk about today. And uh, in the case of Silene, of course, there's been already presented information that but even by MLST years ago, uh, there was uh, described that homology recommendation is more important than point mutation for genetic diversity. Um, so uh, how do you get DNA from outside? There's like three main mechanisms, but I'm gonna make sure they talk about natural competence or natural transformation. That is the idea that was uh, first uh, proved by the group of Rodrigo Almeida, that has been a collaborator in this project. And uh, he showed that you can, the Silella can really take DNA from the environment and, and recombine and put it in their uh, genome. And uh, this is mediated by type 4 Pili, basically. And this uh, mechanism occurs uh, principally in highly adaptive human pathogens, okay? So, and there's only two plant pathogens that we know of that they are, that can do this. And one is Rostonia solanaceatum, the other one is Silella fastidiosa. And I'm gonna talk about that. So over the years, we've been working in my lab on the, trying to understand the mechanism of molecular recombination by natural transformation in vitro, mainly. So we did a lot of experiments like these ones when we can uh, kill one of the cells, keep the other one alive, grow, put them together, or have two cells growing together. We marked it differentially with different antibiotics, so we have a marker so we can follow each one of the strains. And then we select, and then we see if they are able to recombine. Uh, some of the experiments that we did in the lab will give us some information of what conditions are more conducive for this uh, recombination, uh, natural competence. Uh, we did, uh, okay, I went too fast. Uh, uh, we did some experiments when, uh -huh, sorry again. 
Uh, we did it in the microfluidic chamber, so under flow conditions, we see that the frequency of recombination is, is as high as you can get in vitro. So these uh, are able to recombine in a, something that is similar to a sudden vessel, which is a, our microfluidic chamber system. And we found that some of the components that increase uh, recombination is, for instance, calcium. The level of calcium uh, makes a higher recombination. And that explains because we saw that calcium is also uh, improving the movement of the, the typhoid pili. So typhoid pili being involved in this process makes sense that this will be the case. Okay, we also saw that this recombination ability is very variable depending on the strain. That of course also inter and intra so specific uh, recombination. We, uh, experimentally we show, uh, sorry again, uh, that the, uh, we make mixtures and we see some of the strains were not able to recombine with other ones, but other ones were very good. The best one that we have is this one, WM11, that was recombining DNA from different sources and it was like the highest frequency was one recombining cell every 10 to the two, 100 cells, so it was very high. The other ones is every 10 to the four or 10 to the five. Okay, so um, uh, during this process, so we develop a protocol uh, for mutagenesis that we use in natural transformation and overlap PCR. And this uh, was published, is, you won't be able to read this, but was published a year. Uh, this was done in fastidiosa multiple strains. I've been talking to Alessandro and other people in Italy, in Pauca doesn't seem to work as well, uh, but in, in fastidiosa worked very well. I even implemented this uh, process in, uh, in my course. We graduated undergraduate courses, and then all of the groups of set one were able to create mutants. And uh, we've done this with a lot of uh, people coming with, thanks to the cost action Eurosant. We received multiple people in my lab and all of them have been trained on this uh, technique and it's working for them as well. And uh, one of the things we, we were able to uh, even um, done mutants in these uh, different homologs, the uh, uh, parallax or the field A1 and A2, and we can see the function of these different ones. And at this moment we have generated in less than two years more than 50 mutants in uh, Salera fastidiosa in my lab. So what I'm gonna talk about today more specifically is uh, we did this recombination in vitro as I mentioned before, and we wanted to sequence the genomes of these recombinants to see how much recombination occurs in vitro and how can we this inform us of how this is happening in nature. Okay, so we did uh, this uh, recombination that is um, alive in a dead cell. This case of the blue one is because it's sub suspicious multiplex. The black ones are suspicious fastidiosa. So one inter specific, one inter uh, uh, intra specific and one that we grow the two cells alive. So we sequence the parents and we sequence the recombinants. Only two, ideally we will have much more, but we didn't have money to sequence more back then. So we just need like two of each one. And uh, we, uh, I want to uh, remind you that uh, all these things we selected recombinants for antibiotic resistance. So the only way that we can tell that they're recombined is because they acquire a cassette, all right? So that was the, the basis. And when we look at how much of recombination occurs in this one, we have, as I mentioned, these ones that are interspecific and intraspecific recombination. Interestingly, uh, again, with a very small sample, we saw that the interspecific recombination occurs only in the flanking regions of the canamycin cassette with different sizes, uh, depending on the, on, the, on the mutants. But the intraspecific uh, recombination, we were able to detect not only in the marking in the cassette, but also away from the cassette in a couple of regions, okay? We don't know if this is holds true because uh, it's very uh, limited, but one hypothesis can be that the, is, the somehow the inter is less um, uh, profuse, the recombination than the intra, but we don't really know about that. So uh, with that, we say, well, let's see what happened in nature. We saw that in vitro, so like we identified these regions and recombinants in, in vitro, let's see what happens in nature. And we did phylogeny with Neha. So basically, uh, Marie and Jacques show also the, the core genome uh, uh, gene. Uh, this is a maximum likelihood uh, tree. You see the same like, species. And uh, what we did is like filter the recombination region so you can take away all these regions that they are recombining. And we saw that the, taking that away changes the phylogeny you know, of the things. Uh, notably, this uh, uh, suspicious morus or so-called suspicious morus uh, changes the phylogeny with this uh, sandai uh, when you do that. Okay, so that was uh, interesting. Other thing that we found interesting was that we have five strains that in the literature were called Temecula 1 that they end up being in two different groups even when we take away the recombination. So it seems to be like the, the strains maybe not, they're not exactly Temecula 1 uh, in the literature. And we did fast gear that you guys who, who are not familiar with that. Basically what you do here is you represent uh, the genomes of each strain 
uh, uh, this is like 55 strains. The different colors uh, show different uh, subspecies. And if you don't have recombination, you will see solid colors. If you have recombinations, you see uh, mixed colors. Uh, so you see some of these different colors in these different uh, genomes. Uh, we did that uh, recent and also uh, ancestral recombination. Okay, all right. And uh, you see that uh, that's the case. And we saw, since they were already described, that there's a subgroup in multiplex that is very recombinant, while the other one is not. And the uh, more Sandai group is very recombinant or mosaic uh, structure. Okay, so we look at how much uh, recombination occurs in this one. So we go into the, each subspecies, and we look at the total length of recombination in KB, how much of the genome represents this, and how many recombination events we see. So you can see, Basically the same. The highest one was the Morus of Sunday, as, uh, as I um, talk about, and also the multiplex. Also, uh, this is more influenced by that subgroup that is um, very recombinant. Okay, so we saw the uh, percentage of the genome, and then we went to uh, some strains that they were intercepted that were available in the genome, in the sorry, in the databases, some from uh, all from groups here in in Europe. So when you look at, the, at these genomes, and we got a couple of them from uh, Maria Bergsma-Blami from the Netherlands, and uh, we saw that this was species, so this is the five strains that we look at, and you see that the recombination in this case was higher than the other ones in general, not 100%, uh, but this doesn't work again. Okay, uh, hopefully we can pass that, but I will, to show you that the, the length of recombination, you see that this one has 600 KB, 27% of the genome seems to be recombinant, while the other ones have less. Yeah, and this is the percentage of the genome. Uh, let's see. Can you pass to the next slide? To there? No? Okay. There we go. Okay. Now we're doing something. Apologize for the delay. So uh, we uh, map this uh, length of recombinations. So what you see in this uh, graph is the number of recombination events and the length of the recombination fragment. Yeah? So it's divided by so species, and each color is a different strain. Yeah. So you see, basically, you see like a normal distribution. In this case, you see like two main fragments that I was uh, describing in Helicobacter pylori that seem to be a preference for a specific uh, size, but we don't know exactly if that's what's going on in, in Salela. And in the other, um, in the other uh, group of strains, you see the same thing. And uh, what you see here is like a lot of red dots are like standing out like in the top of this recombination. So the higher number of events and length, and uh, that is the intercepted strain. Okay, so the one that we mark in color is those one that I told you about the interception. And we wanted to also ask if there are some recombination hotspots. It's like areas that they recombine more than others. And that was a question that we were trying to uh, answer before, but we didn't have the tools to do it. And thanks to uh, the help of uh, Neha Podnes, we were able to do it. So we started by looking at the, the stuff that we did in, in, the, in vitro. I told you that we found regions away from the cassette that they were recombining to. Okay? So we tried to see what genes or, uh, annotated in those regions were recombining. And we found some uh, uh, hydrolase, some uh, serine proteases, and some uh, extracellular proteases. So this is the, the recombinant that we found then. And we look at these ores, if they were recombining also in nature, and this is the events, how many times we found it in different subspecies. And uh, we say, well, what, are the fun do, what do we know about the function of these genes uh, to explain uh, Salela? Okay, so this is the function. The one that I mark with the XF is because there's data shown in uh, Salela. This one has not been studied in Salela so far, so we don't know if it has a function for the virulence. But interestingly enough, uh, if I can show the next slide, Okay, these two genes that are studying Salera, they were discovered by uh, a, com a genomic comparison between Temecula and, and A virulent strain EV92. So these two genes that uh, they prove in that paper that is important for virulence, we found them recombining in things in vitro that we selected for a canamycin cassette, not for this. So that was intriguing for us, how, why is they recombining something important for virulence when uh, we didn't select for that. So let's say, okay, let's go back to, the nat to nature and see what are the function of these genes and their recombination in, uh, in the wild type strains that we have. I wish I'd know what is the, okay, here. 
So uh, my student, Marcus, with uh, Neha, they designed this pipeline to try to understand this. And we uh, uh, made a selection of uh, a thousand genes that they were somehow uh, annotated, that they were uh, about 40% of the genome of Salera were identified in these recombinant regions. And for the sake of clarity and uh, to wrap around our, our head around some concepts, we selected the top 10% of these ones. So there's about 100 genes that have more than 19 recombination events each, and we try to see the function of these genes. Okay, so this is the top 10 uh, ranking of the most recombinant uh, genes among uh, we found in nature. As you can see, the number one by far is the hypothetical uh, protein, but this is of course is biased because everything that is uh, annotated as a hypothetical protein is, is lumped into this group. So we don't know, of course, it's probably it's more than one gene is multiple. But the uh, number two, for instance, is a, a vitamin B12 transporter, BTUB, that we know nothing about in cellula. But in human pathogens, it's known to regulate gene expression, enzyme activity, abundance of microorganisms, virulence, and biofilm. But we don't know if it's doing something in cellula. And the number three is one that you guys uh, heard about it earlier today from Steve Lindau. Is the RPFC is part of this uh, DSF quantum sensing uh, mechanism. So that's, those are the ones that they were more um, prominent. So what we did, we went, went back to that uh, 100 genes uh, list, and uh, we, we uh, organized by the different uh, functions that they may have, the category, the different uh, uh, molecular components of this. And without going into details, uh, you see whatever is red are genes that were, have been studied in the ecological role in Cellella. The ones in black, we don't know nothing, but we know in other bacteria that they are important for uh, virulence or adaptation to uh, an environment. So with that, we went back and we tried to think about the ecology of this bacteria and see if, how can we map this gene in the, the function of this gene in different processes. And we found, of course, things important, as you guys know, the bacteria inside the vessels needs a lot of attachment to survive under flow conditions. Also in the insect needs a lot of attachment. As uh, Steve Linda showed today in the morning, uh, DSF is an important molecule to uh, make this transition between being sticky or not sticky and going into the insect or not. Uh, we saw some uh, affirmative additions, sensor kinases. Uh, H this is a small RNA that we don't know, we know nothing about small RNAs in, in Salela. And nutrient acquisition, that tryptophan is for site. So some of the stuff we don't know what they're doing in Salela, but by other uh, systems we can tell what is the, the function of this stuff. So with that, uh, I'm just going to uh, go into my uh, conclusions, if I can go to the next. Okay, so we found that this uh, location of recombinogenic genes, uh, ge regions in vitro is very variable. It's, of course, also away from the one that we are selecting for in vitro. Uh, in wild types, the influence of phylogeny, interceptor strains seem to be very highly recombinant. And uh, many genes that they are recombining are important for bacterial fitness, virulence, and ecological adaptation. So, our hypothesis is that the model recombination improves the response to selection, as I was talking at the beginning, or in other words, increase the fitness of Salera fastidiosa. And what we feel is like what we are doing now is uh, all these, as you guys know, all these isolates that we have sequenced, uh, most of them or all of them are uh, taken from plants that they are symptomatic. So we are selecting from things that bacteria that are already had adapted or have climbed this hurdle of a new host, and that's what we found. So that's what we think the genes that we identify are important for the ecology of Salela. And with that, I just want to say uh, thank you for the funding sources, for uh, the invitation, uh, and if we have time, I'm open for a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Is there any question? Hi, Stephen White, uh, CH. Uh, apologies for this is a, might be a really stupid question because it's your expertise is far from mine. Um, do you think you'd ever be able to predict um, which strains you should not combine? Uh, so you could, you know, which, which, in other words, if we were thinking about sort of uh, biosecurity and which plants we should not be moving around the world because they may have uh, xylella strains, I mean, we shouldn't do it anyway, but, you know, if, if we have xylella strains that are potentially could be recombined into, uh, into, say, from Europe into the Americas, which would produce something that's super virulent. I mean, do you think you'd ever be able to predict that? Uh, no, <laughs> but, uh, 
But so, but, but we know it's like, for instance, all these interceptor trains were all from coffee, the five strains that we know of. And they were, most of them, like four or five, highly recombinant. So there's also the mulberry story that people who find strains in mulberry are very recombinant too. So you think that that's a fertile ground for recombination. But I could not get the, those strains from, I tried to get the strains from mulberry from researchers and they were dead or they never sent it to me. So we wanted to study if those are more virulent or not in different hosts. But yeah, at this moment, we don't know. We need more information for that. Yeah. Other question? Yeah, just uh, one, one question. Uh, you showed, uh, as you were, uh, were mention, uh, mentioning, that uh, uh, the most re recombinant, the highly recombinant strain we found in coffee. And uh, um, in general, we know that in coffee we don't have severe uh, symptoms, so most probably these uh, highly recombinant uh, strain are mild in coffee. So which is the, 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 the rationale behind the, this? Uh, because in general, we are worried in Europe that uh, uh, the recombination would uh, uh, determine the appearance of new ag aggressive strains. So based on this experience, what you can say? Yeah, we don't know because it depends on uh, where. And uh, as you know, there is no much information of like, you know, people don't trace the same strains in multiple hosts because it's so complicated and it takes so much time that there's not a lot of information of the strain for coffee that we tested in like 10 or 20 hosts and see if it's a bit another one. So at this moment, it's just uh, yeah, like a hypothesis, but we don't know. Thank you. If there are no questions, we can uh, go to the next presentation. Thank, Thank you. Very much. So the, the last uh, presentation for uh, in this session uh, will be given by Professor Rodrigo Almeida of University of California, Berkeley, uh, who led uh, uh, the largest uh, project on uh, genome sequencing and will provide some uh, uh, insight about what, we, what information we can gather and retrieve uh, from the genomic uh, side uh, versus the ecological and biological. Uh, information which, uh, as uh, Leonardo was saying, are uh, uh, difficult to uh, to get from uh, because the uh, in vivo experiment are long term experiment and difficult to perform. So I, I give the floor to uh, Rodrigo, who will. Uh, uh, the title of the presentation is "Can Genome Sequences Tell Us Anything Worthwhile About Xylella Fastidiopsychology?" Thank you. Cool. Um, thank you, uh, Maria. Um, Thank you, everybody, for the invitation. Um, I'd like to say that um, I lived in, in France for over a year, and uh, Corsica was the one place that everybody told me to, to go to, and I didn't have the opportunity, and uh, it is indeed uh, beautiful. It's re really great to be here. Uh, in fact, I'll go back home, I'll tell Trump that he's looking to buy an island in Europe, and maybe he, sh he should try buying Corsica. Um, so, um, it's really great to actually be talking after Blanca, Maria, uh, Maria Agnes, and uh, Leo, um, because I don't really have to introduce most of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, and actually try to get right to uh, some of the work that we've been doing, uh, and without really overlapping much with um, what they they have talked about. So that's uh, that's really great. Uh, the other thing is that um, I'm really only going to focus here. In, in what I think is more of the population level or the ecological processes. So we're talking about recent events and trying to understand epidemics, outbreaks, rather than some other questions that we're, we're thinking about, but uh, will really not be covered here. So uh, before getting started, uh, I just want to mention that uh, the work I'll, I'll, I'll be presenting here uh, was done primarily by uh, Anne Sikar, uh, who is here, uh, Mathieu, who left the lab, um, Andreina is doing much of the current work, and Alexandra, uh, she's here, and she will actually give a talk looking at host uh, plant relationships using ancestral state reconstructions later today or tomorrow. Okay. All right, so um, I've been rather curious about what can actually genomic data tell us that is uh, useful. <laughs> and by useful, I don't mean that, uh, uh, I mean at the applied level right, at the population level, in, they can inform management, uh, not necessarily generate more papers. So to start with this uh, question, what we did is we sequenced a bunch of genomes. Um, we, our data set is about 300 
and 49 genomes, I was told yesterday by, by Alexandra. Um, and they weren't just sequencing sort of anyway. They were actually, uh, we sequenced a lot of them to answer specific questions. So we have about, uh, um, we try to improve coverage, phylogenetic coverage of poorly characterized groups of Xylala. That includes uh, Fastidios in Costa Rica together, together with uh, Carlos, uh, who's here, uh, as well as Multiplex. We have also, uh, we also have two particular populations we're interested in. One is an outbreak, which is the Italian population. We have about 75 something genomes on, in that one and also uh, Pierce's disease in, in California and the U.S., and we have 150-something genomes for that population. So the first thing that it has become clear already um, is that Zalal is very diverse, right? So once you think about, this is true for any bacterial species, it should be no different for Zalala, uh, and that is the case. So the core genome, the genes that are shared by all Zalala, is actually a small fraction of the genome, it's, it's a sort of less than 50% uh, based on the annotations that we uh, uh, are using, which are not particularly good. Um, and you have a huge amount of accessory genome that is unique to particular uh, uh, groups of, of Xylella or particular strains, but not to the entire uh, uh, species. So essentially, this over here, you can think of it as being the core, uh, and this here is what we call the pan genome, or things that are not shared by everybody. Uh, this tree here, uh, I'll have lots of trees, sorry, those of you that don't like trees, but it's kind of how it goes. Um, uh, it sort of illustrates the same thing that uh, you have seen in three uh, previous talks. I just want to bring up your attention to uh, everything we do, we include uh, a core versus accessory. We split those two for most of the analysis. Accessory genomes violate pretty much all assumptions of phylogenetic trees. Uh, um, and, and, uh, and uh, recombination, actually. Uh, so we split between core and accessory, and we also do analysis including recombination and, and without recombination in the data set. So it's, it's great that uh, Leo and, and Maria Agnes already kind of covered much of that, uh, so I'm not really going to get into the details. The really cool thing here is that, for example, if you include recombination or no recombination, you can split Pauka, for example, into two groups. If you include recombination, you don't split it if you don't include, recombi if you, if you don't include recombination. Um, you have this weird little group here that uh, is probably part of Fastidiosa with Sandia and Morris, and um, depending on how, you know, it forms a, a unique clade regardless of recombination or no recombination being included. Um, this is the only slide that's going to uh, uh, overlap with what Blanca um, brought up, and I just want to mention that uh, Multiplex has been sort of interesting uh, for a long time. Uh, Len Nooney, when he first described it, he described it two major clades, one that recombines and one does not, that does not recombine. Uh, but we now think that the story is that the one that does not recombine is not that it doesn't recombine, it's just that it, it's young and he hasn't had enough time to recombine as much compared to this other one. The other thing, as Blanca mentioned, is that we think Multiplex originated from the East Coast in the United States. It was introduced into California, and then from California, it made its way to, to, to Europe, at least based on the phylogenetic data here. And last but not least, ST6 uh, um, are not monophyletic, which obviously has applied importance. And even if you go in here within STs, um, you have multiple host plants that are affected by, by, by the same ST. So the, Applied value of ST kind of depends on the clade, uh, depends on the group, and, and it's not universal. You know, you can't just use ST for, for everything and expect the same level of genetic diversity and also phenotypic diversity. Um, so uh, one of the things that Leo and I uh, like to spend a lot of time arguing with each other is about the role of uh, recombination or, uh, in, in, in Zalala pathogenicity, adaptation, and virulence, and uh, we kind of agree, and we also disagree a lot about what is going on. So here's one example uh, that we have uh, from genomic data. This is in citrus. You have two different clades in citrus, one on top and one on the bottom. Leo already explained to you how to read these graphs. But what's really interesting is that if you talk to, to Alessandra and Elvasio, and that they say that this group down here is actually more virulent in, in citrus than the group up above. So in this case, for example, we're trying to, we have generated the list of the genes here and trying to see if we can make any sense out of it. Um, you know, can we link these genes to any of the phenotypes that uh, Alessandra has uh, in, in planta, but also in vitro? 
Um, the other thing is um, kind of similar to, to what Leo did. We, we used a different data set and we tried to look for uh, which groups of genes were enriched in terms of recombination. And in our case, we found no difference. Essentially, all different groups of genes that uh, we looked at were equally subject to uh, recombination. So while I'm very interested in recombination and its role, and it obviously generates a lot of diversity, its particular role in, in virulence and adaptation is not very clear, um, at least to me. So uh, you and I can't, can't meet and not talk about it uh, forever. Um, the other thing is that, uh, again, just uh, the, the, uh, the two previous talks, is that uh, you can actually use uh, history, essentially, and try to infer uh, recent and ancestral recombination events, so those are ecologically relevant. Uh, this is an example using three different types of looking at the data, and my point here is just to, um, this is uh, in Costa Rica, we try to only look at the Costa Rican population to see what's going on there because you have an interesting situation with two, you know, with an endemic strain, which is diverse, uh, an endemic group that's diverse, but also an introduced one. We're kind of interested in looking at recombination patterns. And uh, what I really want you to notice is that you have recent events and ancestral events and how these different figures differ from each other. They're not the same. The really cool one to me personally is this one over here that we can identify the donor strains and the recipient strains in these interactions. Um, and you can see how the pattern for recent events, donor and recipient, are very different from the patterns for ancestral events. So uh, just like was just brought up, you can actually s split these sort of interactions apart um, and try to make sense out of it. Uh, at this point, we know they're different, but we haven't been able to really interpret this in, in any meaningful way. Oh. Um, and uh, I just want to bring up that one of the things that we've been able to do with recombination is actually look for uh, known unknowns in the sense looking for sequences that we know exist, but we cannot place them phylogenetically within any group of xylella. And we have been able to find essentially lots of evidence of new xylella that is very divergent from what we know exists, uh, but we, for which we have no like core sort of ancestral genome, or we don't have an example of that uh, 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 genome or phylogenetic uh, location in terms of having an, an isolate that um, is out there. So essentially, meaning um, uh, we know that there is more Zalala that we actually don't know what it is, if that makes any sense. Um, the other thing we've been able to uh, do is uh, reconstruct the history of uh, Zalala uh, sort of uh, epidemics. Uh, we first started at the species level. Um, uh, it turns out that dating this year is actually pretty complicated. You can't always do. Um, in this case, uh, we were able to, to generate some dates that uh, um, we, you know, we could do technically. And um, these numbers here kind of match very much the ones that uh, Maria Inez proposed uh, based on her data, which makes sense. Um, but most of the epidemics or the strains that we know exist uh, are fairly recent. Um, we've been using this in different contexts. Again, I'm becoming more interested in the ecology of it. So um, this is uh, uh, data from um, trying to contextualize what's happening in Central America. Um, so you have to put, in Central America, you have fastidiosa subspecies, uh, and you also have pauca that was introduced from South America into Central America. Um, so you have this little group here, which eventually ended up in, in Italy. Um, and then you have uh, Pierce's disease in the United States that was introduced from Central America as well. And from California, it made its way to, to Mallorca. And from the East Coast, it made its way to Taiwan. So essentially, you can actually use this sort of data to uh, infer pathways uh, in many ways and also um, try to understand how much diversity you have in each location. So um, if you eliminate this data from Costa Rica here, um, the fastidiosa group is, is relatively boring, uh, not a whole lot of diversity, but once included here, uh, you can see that there's a lot more di diversity in the group. Um, in addition to that, uh, it, it makes it very clear case that um, PD is not endemic to the United States, it was actually introduced. Um, we uh, are working on the data set from um, Apulia, this is Anne's uh, work. Um, Anne is somewhere here, I hope. 
Uh, anyway, Anne has a poster. I just took these uh, images from her poster. Um, it's an interesting data set, and part of what's kind of intri intriguing here is that making sense out of it had turned out to be more complicated than we thought. I just want to uh, bring up the fact that a photo um, tip dating here uh, to try to date the introduction put it, puts it around uh, 2005, depending on the details, and can, can go all over those with you. Um, it, more specifically, um, and also she has a, a long list of uh, genes that are under uh, selection uh, that we're hoping that these genes can tell us a little bit about uh, adaptation of that particular uh, group of xylella to olives. And um, the other thing is that uh, we try, we've been trying to use genomics to understand sort of the populations, broadly speaking. This is uh, Pierce's disease in California. Um, and what's really interesting in this case is that uh, even though it's, it's one state, it's one disease, you have the same vectors for the most part, um, uh, at least along the coast, each region, each grape growing region of California has its own population of, of, of Zalala. And what's interesting is that each population also has particular sets of genes that are under selection, suggesting that in grapevines, same vectors, in California, different populations are subject to different types of selective pressures. Um, and uh, that has actually been really difficult to make sense out of. We don't know why you have this structure, which is, is really, in many ways, very, very, very pretty. It's pretty cool. Um, but we don't really know why you have this. Um, we've been trying to use landscape genomics approach. Uh, we've been able to link some SNPs to climatic variables. But that's just correlation, and, and we don't really know any function. Uh, we, we haven't been able to prove that uh, temperature, for example, is the reason that you have strains that are more adapted to very warm climates here versus strains that are more adapted to kind of milder climates. So um, to wrap up, um, you know, has genomic data been helpful? And, and the answer, the short answer is yes. However, uh, we've learned a lot in the last few years as to the limitations of this. Uh, the, first, the first thing we found out is that most of the questions we actually want to address or ask uh, we don't really have the data for it. The data we have are sort of random things that got sequenced out there. Uh, we put them together and we try to use it the best we can, but it's just not quite the right thing. Um, and what we've learned is that, like in the California example, if you think about the questions first and then you go after the data, you collect your isolates and you come back and then you sequence and you do have enough of a data set, over 100 genomes in that example, you can actually try to start addressing those questions more uh, appropriately. Um, the other thing is that every time we do any study with, with these genomes, it doesn't matter what we're looking at, we end up with lists and lists and lists of genes. And the question is, what do you actually do with those lists and lists of genes? Uh, if you eventually you want to knock, you know, sp specific uh, genes out, look for the function, test. Uh, from a mechanistic uh, perspective, uh, this seems to be incredibly uh, difficult to actually narrow it down to something that you can manage. Um, it's particularly frustrating. The other thing is uh, we've learned the, the importance of having raw data. A lot of the material that's deposited in GeneBank, it's not that great, the assembled genomes. Uh, so we really encourage everybody to deposit the raw data for your sequences that it has turned out to be really important uh, and something that uh, is, is a, of concern for us. And uh, at the very end, you know, we're trying, um, but we're, it's very clear we're very tip of the iceberg here in terms of uh, what we can actually learn from these genomes. It has been very helpful in understanding particular things uh, at the ecological level, dispersal pathways, uh, structure, diversity, but actually linking that to biology uh, has not been particularly simple, and I'm not really sure uh, how long it will take to, to do that. So uh, I'll just finish with that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Rodrigo. Are there any questions? Uh, maybe they will come later, and I, I can invite the speakers uh, to sit here for uh, uh, the final discussion of this uh, session. So if there are uh, questions uh, to Rodrigo or the previous speaker, uh, we, we can answer. So I invite Blanca, Maria Agnes, Pasquale, and Leo to come 
yeah, in, in the meantime, a uh, consideration that the, the major part of the contribution are our genomics, uh, whereas the biological studies are those that uh, take more time and are uh, more difficult uh, to, to achieve. Uh, and we, we, we need also, uh, for performing biological studies, we, we need facilities, containment facilities that, uh, uh, investment in uh, containment facilities that uh, are relevant. And so, uh, as Blanca showed, uh, to, uh, the, the work has uh, started, but uh, there is a huge effort to, to get uh, um, results from the biological studies. And at this moment in Europe, uh, uh, we should invest in applied research for this purpose because uh, um, based on what has been reported from all outbreaks, we have more than uh, 80 host uh, plants. We have some areas under containment, so uh, for sure this, uh, this list uh, of plants cannot be considered at the same uh, level. They have not uh, the same role in each uh, epidemics, and so uh, it should be studied uh, what uh, is the, the role, the, 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 the epidemiological role of the different species in each outbreak so that uh, measure can be uh, better uh, targeted and be more uh, sustainable, as well as it is important within each species or varieties to investigate if there are a phenomena of resistance uh, that can, uh, can help uh, to, to manage the, the outbreak. So if uh, there are uh, questions for the speakers. Easier to see from here. So, St Steve, uh, one question. Hi, it's Stephen White, CH. Um, so, you, a few of you mentioned um, that uh, xylem uh, vessel size is really important for resistance mechanisms. Have you ever looked for actual number of xylem vessels amongst sort of olive cultivars, for example? So that I, I want I want to say that the, this is an hypothesis that I, I mutuate from the the, the, um, the grape studies. So we are uh, looking not only for this, but also if, also for the aggregation of the xylem vessels, because we think that uh, if you have aggregated vessels besides the the vessel diameters, that could be important for the bacteria to move from one vessel to the other which is close to, the, to this one but we have not data uh, not enough data to, to to do this for now we have the data that we uh, i presented uh, before thanks other question yes okay uh, pasquale di Rubo from uh, the european commission uh, the plant health unit um, so it seems clear that indeed we are uh, uh, facing uh, the still the edge of the iceberg in terms of uh, genomic uh, data and there is still a lot of information also within the same uh, sequence type so a lot of uh, uh, diversity still exists so in the end probably the sequence type as such does not say much uh, given still the big diversity that we have to explore and we have to study. And I was wondering whether the panel could explore, uh, could extend a bit more in terms of management of the disease, uh, such kind of diversity, what does it mean in practice and how we could indeed um, have a, a robust uh, management strategy in place. Thank you. Maria Agnes, who want to answer? <laughs> well, uh, this is not an easy question, but I think one point that could be very important to consider is the fact that most of the data, the data we have comes from, some, from strains that were isolated from plant samples. And I think none of the strains we have, or none of the sequence, came from strains that were isolated from insects. Or insects are very important, of course, in the epidemiology of Zalela. And we do not know a lot 
on the extent of the diversity of Zalela strains in insects compared to plants. And I think to be able to, to design anything on the management, we have also to have access to this other part of the diversity. So I think that's one important point we have to face in the future. Well, I think one uh, very important point to consider is how to establish host range of strains. In Europe, of course, most of the data we have came from sampling in natural uh, environment, and these sampling are not exhaustive because they cannot be. So we certainly only have a part of the host range of the plant, and even in that host range, some plants seem to be more uh, frequently contaminated than others. So really it's not in easy to, to translate this kind of data in management options so far. We still need a lot of work, I think, to be able to do that. I don't know if uh, Blanca or Rodrigo wants to add or Leo or something. Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, Maria next. Uh, I'm sure that um, uh, if we inoculate, if we, we could have the chance to inoculate hundreds of hosts with all the STs that we have discovered in Europe, maybe we can have completely 100% infection. But doesn't mean that we will have disease. Under natural conditions, maybe the vectors doesn't like to go and fit in some host, or the acquisition, it depends uh, greatly on the sequence type or the host, we don't know. So for management, um, it's so complicated because otherwise maybe in, after a few years we have to remove <laughs> all, all the potential hosts or, or in, in an area. And having a look to the different uh, genotypic background, uh, maybe uh, we have to develop a specific uh, regulation for each particular area. And this is almost impossible for, for Europe. Uh, but uh, we cannot extrapolate uh, what is going on in, in, for instance, in Corsica, will be the same in, in Alicante, uh, because we know already that they are completely different genotypes. So you have a very difficult tax, I think, for the legislation in, in the following years. Yeah, I, I just uh, can add uh, uh, s some concept that uh, uh, we discussed uh, some, day, some weeks ago with Professor uh, Purcell uh, visiting uh, us uh, in Bari, that uh, the, list, the current list of, uh, of the host plants is based mainly only on uh, our uh, detection. But we lack uh, uh, in information about how these uh, uh, hosts uh, support a propagative a systemic uh, infection, uh, which means uh, how this, uh, this host can be a source of inoculum for the vector, because in some cases we can get, we can have uh, inoculation detection, but uh, not a fully uh, systemic infection. So still that plant uh, is classified as host plant, but uh, uh, maybe uh, is not a source of bacterium from, uh, from the, the, the vectors. And so has a different epidemiological uh, significance than uh, other hosts. So th this uh, applied work uh, should be uh, done because as uh, was shown, uh, even with, within the same ST, we may have a different biological uh, uh, behavior. Uh, between the strain falling uh, with the same ST. Other comments or uh, question? There was uh, Elvesio. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and my name is Abid Geram from the Vulcani Center. Uh, my question is uh, taking together uh, all sequence data of the different isolates and recombinants. Uh, is there, do you have any idea uh, to explain the severity of the disease in Italy uh, comparing to other European countries or uh, to the situation in uh, the US? Um, I, I think that severity is very relative term. Um, I mean, you have this one introduction and um, 
this one strain, we never heard of it, ends up in, from Central America where you don't have olives, lands, you know, in an environment where you have lots of olives. Um, there was no way of predicting that, but severity is very relative. It turns out to be particularly bad epidemic, um, but we don't have any you know, reason to think it's better or worse um, than other cases that are out there. So for example, some people think the multiplex is not that pathogenic. Uh, you can go visit Leo and he will show you some multiplex that are incredibly pathogenic. Um, so I think that that's, it's just one that ecologically you end up with a lot of, uh, with an epidemic compared to other situations where you may not end up with an epidemic. Um, that's that's kind of how I think about it. If I can add something, I think to consider an epidemic, you have also to consider the landscape, the homogeneity of the landscape, some cultural practices, and uh, of course some abiotic uh, environmental conditions. Altogether, these are maybe uh, peculiar in uh, Italy, rendering this strain in Italy uh, the source of a strong epidemic. So far, this, well, or similar ST, we don't know if it is the same strains or not, but ST53 strains have been identified in, uh, I think, apart Costa Rica only in France, and in France it's just so far limited. So it's not so far responsible for epidemics in that conditions. But all these conditions, abiotic and biotic, are totally different. And that's, of course, very important in epidemics. We have time just for two quick questions. Uh, yeah. Here on the third row there was... Yeah. Uh. Uh, it's not a question, just a comment about the... Uh, okay, it's Ovesio from Agronomic Institute in São Paulo. It's not a question, but uh, only a comment, comment about the olive resistance varieties and ST. Uh, you, have, you are searching by olive resistance in small germ plants bank that you have in not São Paulo, but in Minas Gerais State. And the Latino variety, it's also resistance uh, but the important that there you have another ST from Pauca, okay? That means that, that it, I suppose that the resistance could be conserved among different Pauca STs. It's just a comment, okay? Okay. Thanks, Alvesio. Uh, Emilio Montesinos. Okay. Um, Emilio Montesinos from uh, University of Girona, from Spain. Well, um, my question is uh, related to methodology. And um, the question is, to what extent uh, the methods used for inoculation to the plant hosts are really representative of what is happening in the field? Because we are uh, taking conclusions on that, and uh, I'm not sure there is a homologate method between all of us uh, to test uh, uh, virulence, aggressiveness of strains, and then to complement the genomic data and transcriptomic data you have been uh, shown. So um, they're not exactly the same. We have some evidence that insect inoculation and mechanical inoculation are not quite equal. Um, having said that, uh, except for that initial stage of inoculation, um, for purposes that you're kind of asking, um, you know, o over time, um, it seems like the two, you know, insect versus mechanical, the response you're going to get from the plant are, are pretty much the same. Um, but they're not, early on in the infection uh, event, uh, we know that those two types of inoculations are, are different. The, the last question. Oh. Had some, uh, we don't have a, a, a good model system in olives. That is, uh, that is the reason uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of timeline of uh, progression of symptoms and also of the infections. That reason that uh, 
pushed us to use chronic infection. Paradoxically, uh, uh, chronic infection seems to respond better than, uh, than, than greenhouse plants, in which also we should we wait for the appearance of symptoms. So uh, there is a, um, when we try to, to evaluate the, the plant response in the early time after the infection, this is not easy to, to, to address, uh, an easy task to address uh, in olive. So that, uh, that is our experience. It is true that we are also trying to use uh, vectors uh, often to infect the plants, so to to uh, uh, remove this uh, the, uh, the artifact of the artificial inoculation. The, the last question, uh, Massimiliano. Uh, Massimiliano Morelli from uh, CNR Bar Italy. I have a question to Professor De La Fuente. Uh, in uh, your talk, you said that uh, when you supply um, calcium. Uh, to your uh, strain, uh, you see it seems that uh, your strain is more prone to recombination event. And uh, I wonder if you think that uh, as a future research effort, we can think if um, external application of uh, such a substances or other substances can uh, lead to um, a targeted uh, um, recombination event that can somehow dismantle uh, Zylella uh, virulence and um, uh, mainly if, uh, as you said, uh, this uh, recombination event seems to be more frequent in uh, genes that are relevant for ecological success of xylella. Okay, so <laughs> you're thinking how, if you can apply something to stop recombination or to reduce recombination? That or to uh, promote some uh, targeted recombination. Yeah, it's hard. Because, yeah, I don't know if it's possible, but it's a, it's a good idea, but I don't know if it's possible because uh, uh, if you believe Rodrigo, uh, recommendation will be useless. But <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you believe me, you will make it worse if you, you know, target recommendation. But <laughs> so it depends on uh, thinking about uh, it, the calcium story here, we saw that it makes sense because we proved before that they move more, so the type 4 pill is more active, so they will take more DNA. If you can do something targeted at this moment, I don't know anything targeted because what we did even in vitro, it ended up causing changes in something else that we were not selecting for. So, all right, I, I know we don't have one more question, but I'm not going to let the one, that one go. Uh, so, uh, I, I think the recombination. Uh, uh, there are two things that are important. One is is that it's, there, it, there's a lot of it happening, right? I mean, everyone has been able to show that. Um, and, and it happens at orders of magnitude kind of more frequently than regular mutations. So it's incredibly important in generating diversity, and then you're going to have selection acting on, on top of that diversity, right? Um, so you're going to have generation of, of rec recombinant, you're going to have recombination events, you're going to have more mutation, and potentially those may be good. In general, any mutation recombination event, you have to assume that it's bad, right? You, you don't see it because those isolates will be less fit. Um, the question really is if, if there is, if the recombination is actually driving uh, adaptation or virulence or something else, um, which is, is a little bit difficult because first you have to identify those genes and then you have to demonstrate that those are conserved uh, in the entire population and then you have to demonstrate that they actually have a mechanistic like, role in, in virulence or adaptation or something. Um, so for that you have to have very large number of genomes for a particular group. Uh, and you have to have those events, they have to be conserved, um, and you also have to do all the functional work. Um, so it's not like we completely disagree on, on things, but we do disagree about some of it, um, and that is, um, you know, we, when we've looked into it, we see no particular group of genes that is recombining more than any other gene necessarily, um, and recombination, the general assumption is that it's random, and in general, that it provides you no benefits. Um, having said that, it increases diversity, and diversity is what you need for selection to act upon. So this is complicated, and I think part of our discussion is not that it's not occurring, it's not relevant, is that actually we don't quite know what it is, uh, and it's not like recombination explains everything. I think that that's kind of the, the main argument here. Okay, thank you. We run out of time, so we have to 
close this uh, session for lunch, which will be at the second floor. After lunch, uh, there will be two parallel sessions, one in this room on, for the vector and one in the room on, uh, at the first floor for the detection. Uh, so I thank you very much, the speakers, for sharing uh, their knowledge and information, and you for the... Uh, for the fruitful discussion. Just one uh, uh, technical annou announcement for the uh, members of the project Ponte and X Factors. Luciana, our uh, responsible, uh, administrative responsible, is outside with, uh, at the desk. Uh, Any time during the day, you, uh, she's collecting your signature uh, for uh, these two days. Thank you.